Okay, let me touch on a couple things just before we get into the Word this morning. Uh, in case you haven't noticed, you go check out where the bread racks used to be. We have our new charging stations over there. So uh, our area will now be set up for all your electronic devices, all right? That's the place to go. Uh, let's see. Now, real quickly, I want to sow this seed. Next week is going to be a very, very special service because it's going to be a grand kind of historic event in the history of the church. We are going to do our mortgage burning celebration next week. Yeah. It's going to be a very special service because it's not just a service, it's, a, it's an event. It's an event. It's one of those days that you capture in the history of the church because it'll be a celebration uh, of the faithfulness of God that we paid off over a million dollars worth of debt in only 18 years. That's quite an accomplishment. We'll give everybody credit together. We, we all want to rejoice. Uh, we want to do what the Bible says, which is what? Make known his mighty deeds and talk about his faithfulness. And so it's not just a service where we want to take 30 seconds and jam it in. We're going to kind of wrap the service around the event of glorifying the Lord and his faithfulness. So the Carsons will be with us, a very special apostolic uh, global kind of couple that are fathers and mothers in the faith received worldwide as such. So it's very, very important and strategic because not only we're going to burn the mortgage, but they're going to pray over us. We're going to pray over the pastoral team, we're going to pray over the church, and we're going to see what they feel about the next steps and kind of confirming some next steps that we've been talking about. Uh, we're going to have our shuttle bus running next week over to the school. We're going to treat it just like we did on Friend Day, which was a huge success, and it went off without a hitch, all right? So if you are not on our email or text notification list, please go on our website today, input your information into there so we can keep you in the loop informationally and you don't miss out on uh, time changes and things like this, or uh, if we have one service, which is going to be the case also next week, it's going to be a monumental kind of deal, all right? So please, if you're not on our email list, get on there now. And we appreciate that. Ushers, do we have gifts? All right, what I'd like to do is, if you are a father this morning, please stand. We have a gift for you to make it a happy Father's Day. Let's go, ushers. Yeah, all of our fathers. Come on, ushers, let's go. It's going to make you smell better <laughs> and everyone around you happier. Isn't that good? So, guys, happy Father's Day. We're going to share it together. I don't know if they have a happy grandfather's day, but I qualify. I just made it out under the wire now. Yeah. All right. Now, now all of them. Now, dads, you can sit down. Everybody else, please stand up. If you're a male, you can stand up. You qualify. 18 years and older. You're a male and you're 18 and older. We want you to smell better, too. See, we're very inclusive when it comes to that. All right, so you may not be a biological father, but I promise you, you impact people around you. You could be a spiritual father to people in your life. So we want to honor you. Some of you will be married one day. and So you are a potential father. You're a father in the making. Which means what you're going to hear today will be crucial for you going into your future. So let's read together. The title of uh, the message this morning, and by the way, we're not going to go crazy with this. Whatever we don't finish today, we're going to finish on this coming Thursday night because this is, I feel, too strategic 
to just kind of want to get through. All right, so here we go. This is crucial when you look at what a mess we have in our society. And the mess that we have in our society is primarily caused by men. Let me say that again. The mess that we have in our society is primarily caused by men. Here's why. Unsaved men in particular, they lack self-discipline. It's all about them. I don't know. There's something that triggers in a guy's brain when he's unsaved uh, and he's thinking in a certain way. He loves to be called a father and impregnate a girl. And then when when the going gets tough, he's nowhere to be found. He flies the coop and he does it to another girl somewhere else. There's this ridiculous NFL player. He has nine kids from coast to coast with eight different women and married to none of them. And I love the fact that they all sued him for child support. In my view, if I had to say, I would go to a radical next level with the guy. But we'll just stick to the lawsuit right now. I'm going to let that kind of waft backwards. <laughs> you're slow, but you're worth waiting for. Because it, it, we'd be doing society a huge favor. So we want to talk about father. What is a father? Just in a flat definition, a father is a male parent. Well, that's ridiculous. That's too flat. We don't want that. Let's get something a little bit more interesting. And uh, I've gone through this first in. Maybe some of you have. Fathers are men who give their daughters to other men who aren't good enough so they can have grandchildren who are better than everybody else's. (laughs) You get that. And here's another working definition. A father who's someone who carries pictures of his kids in his wallet where his money used to be. (laughs) Yeah, just. It's called replacement therapy. All right, so... Yeah. So if you look at the shaded box here, forgive me for the typo, a good father is one of the most unsung, unpraised, unnoticed, and unappreciated heroes in all humanity. Notice what kind of father. A good father. Not a biological one, not a stiff, not a deadbeat, not an absentee landlord, but a good father. Why? Because usually every day he's going to work. Every day he's doing what he has to do. And very often that can get overlooked and taken for granted in some radical ways. And so, you know, I read this little humorous thing. It said, someone has said a boy loves his mother but will follow his father. A boy loves his mother but will follow his father. So what should that speak to us? That should put the fear of God in us. One time, a little boy was asked to define Father's Day, and this is what he said. He said, well, it's just like Mother's Day, only you don't spend as much on the present. (laughs) Yeah. Wow. Now, let me read you a couple things. These are statistically true. From U.S. News and World Report, stated, quote, that more than virtually any other single factor, a biological father's presence in the family will determine a child's success and happiness. Close quote. Without a doubt, this secular article sounded more like a Sunday morning sermon than anything that a secular news outlet would print or dare to print. Why? Because we have a whole educational segment of society that wants to battle against this truth. They want to fight against this truth. They want to make, kind of spin it and portray it as though the real problem is a failing school system instead of this stuff, instead of failing families and absentee fathers or fathers that are just fools. Now, obviously, these, these are a cross-section statistically, all right? So we're dealing with a lot of unsaved people in this, in this mix here. But I want you to know something that Children of, uh, of divorcees, children in divorce situations where they're single parent homes, you make no mistake about it, they're at a much, much higher place of risk for going in a wayward fashion and not doing what they should do and not living and succeeding in life 
the way God intended them to. However, I want you to wrap your head around this good news, is that if you're a Christian mom today, if you're a single mom, or maybe you're a single dad that's raising your kids, if you're a single mom, which is the case in nine out of 10 situations, and you are raising your children, <clears throat> the grace of God will be there for you. These statistics don't have to apply to you across the board. <clears throat> God will help you. The church will help you. People of your church family will help you. <clears throat> Sermons like this will help you. <clears throat> All right, so you don't have to be a statistic. We have many families in the church that are shining examples of what can be done by a single mom when they put their heart and mind and discipline behind it. <clears throat> it's very, very important. <clears throat> but I said this before. If you're a single mom, listen to this, your margin of error is very, very slim. That if a nuclear family could kind of get away with, eh, you know, we can play it loose to about this extent. If you're a single mom, it's a sliver. You can't let anything slide by. you got to be on top of everything because you are wearing multiple hats there. And your children's futures are at stake. So you've got to be highly disciplined. Seek God. Get help. The Lord will help you. And your children can still make it. Amen. And be successful in life and be successful in God. Now, that's why we're doing everything we can do in the children's church. To help you. Not only as single moms, but all of our parents. We want every kid to have an opportunity to know about the Lord and get a spiritual foundation in his or her life because they're facing a world that is so anti-Christ and so lost, so messed up, and our children are getting their cues from all the wrong sources. From Hollywood, from the entertainment, from uh, industry, from primetime TV, all this madness, from all the music that is so full of trash. And these are what our kids are feeding on. So you've got to be on top of, you've got to be at the top of your game. You can't let anything slide. You're going to have to lose some sleep, but stay on the case. Because the devil is at work stealing generations. And... Uh, <clears throat> It's very, very important. So we're doing all that we can do, but at best, you're here twice a week for an hour, so you have to kind of pick up the slack and stay on the case, all right? We want to help you with that. Now, let me give you some more. The National Fatherhood Initiative is an organization that compiles information from a variety of sources concerning specifically the effects of uh, fatherlessness in terms of social problems, including poverty, maternal and ch uh, children's health, uh, incarceration rates, crime, teenage pregnancy, child abuse, drug and alcohol abuse, education, and childhood obesity. So this, this organization compiles statistics. Now let me read a few of them to you. Children in father absentee homes are five times more likely to be poor. Infant mortality rates are 1.8 times higher for infants of unmarried mothers than for married mothers. Youths, youths. <laughs> youths in father absent household. Two youths in father absent households still had significantly higher odds of incarceration than those with a mother and father in the family. Youths are more at risk of substance abuse without a highly involved father, even if he is in the picture. Is he out to lunch spiritually? Is he out to lunch in terms of emotional engagement with the family? Is he just there plopping a paycheck on the table and then grabbing for the remote? Being raised by a single mother raises the risk of teen pregnancy exponentially. Fatherless children are twice as likely to drop out of school. Compared to living with both parents, living in a single parent home doubles the risk that a child will suffer physical, emotional, or educational neglect, uh, and so forth and so on. I don't want to bore you with more statistics, but you get the message, right? Now remember, this is a cross-section of secular situations primarily. So 
If you're a Christian mom today, this doesn't have to be your fate because God will help you. But I want to kind of shake everybody up and hopefully speak to the men in a particular way concerning what a strategic role you play in God's scheme of things. All right, here we go. Look, please, at Roman numeral two, 10 ways to fail as a parent. And I put this in here just so that you'll have it and you can keep reflecting back on it. Number one, you want to totally fail? Go ahead, go for it. Have total all-out fights in front of your children, with your spouse, obviously. Then when victories come, turn around and act all affectionately and lovey-dovey toward each other. Number two, stifle your children's questions by saying, don't bother me now, I'm busy. Uh Uh-oh, I can't tell you how many times we've heard this and had to correct parents about this very thing. Number three, take no interest in your children's friends. Let them run around with whomever they choose. Yeah, that's going to turn out well. Number four, never discipline your children. Try to use, I'm going to rephrase and say, psychobabble instead. (laughs) And sometimes they need a good size 10, 11, or 12, and they're behind. (laughs) That straightens out a multitude of problems. Just like love covers a multitude of sins, a size 10 or 11 or 12 solves a multitude of problems sometimes. And understand, from a scriptural standpoint, loving godly discipline is never, listen to this, a last resort, always an inclusive resort on the front end. Why? Because it's not abuse, and it's not meant to be abusive, and it's not when you're ready to pull your hair out because you've told them 15 times to do the same thing and they won't do it, it's never meant to be like that. That's not discipline. That's blowing your top and losing in anger. If you understand that disciplining your children is a normal, healthy, biblical part of child rearing, then it'll be much more natural for you and you won't get to the point where you're ready to jump out the window or throw him out. That you'll ne- no, no good thing is going to come out of that engagement right there. No good thing is going to come out. That's, in fact, that probably will sow the seeds of abuse when someone loses it in a moment of anger because they've said 15 times to a kid, and now something valuable gets broken. See, you waited too long. You waited too long because that's not discipline. It's not, discipline means you're going to teach and instruct and love as well as... Uh, inflict some corporal punishment on their behind occasion. Then you teach, you instruct, you love, and you kind of help them grow in understanding. Because when their understanding grows, they'll typically behave better. Number five, if you want to totally fail, nag them about their schoolwork and never compliment them on their achievements. Oh, you got an A? Yeah, yeah, good, good, kid, good. Okay. Guess where his emotions went right after that? Why bother trying? I guess no matter what, I'm not going to, you know, this won't impact my dad, my mother. Number six, you want to totally fail? Demonstrate your love for them with material things. Give them everything they ever desire except for time, affection, hugs, love, kisses, time spent together, talking, communicating. Number seven, never discuss the facts of life with them. Instead, let them learn about sex from their friends, public school, or pornographic literature. That's going to turn out well. Number eight, you want to totally fail? Set a bad example so that the children will never want to grow up to be like you. Again, we've had to deal with that on hundreds of occasions. Number nine, absolutely refuse to believe it if you're told that your little Einstein (laughs) has actually done something wrong in school. In other words, side with the kid against the teacher, the school, the principal, and the administration before you even know the facts. You know what you are reinforcing in your kids? That authority can be torn down and come against any time you raise your voice. That's what's going on all across our country. There's no respect for authority anymore. At all. 
And we have an administration and we have people in pol political positions that are enforcing that mentality. <clears throat> Under the name of civil rights or personal rights, or you have the right to, listen, you don't have the right to burn cities down or shoot people or attack police or attack somebody else. That's not a right. That's goofy. So we have to make sure that we're teaching our children the right principles, the way Jesus would live, the way the scriptures teach us. And number 10, if you want to totally fail, let your children make their own choices in the matter of religion. Be careful not to influence them in any way. Oh, you don't want to come to church with us? We understand. You want to follow God? Oh, we understand. Sure, no problem. I would never want to force anything on you. Really? Try and make that square with the scriptures. It won't. Remember Joshua? As for me and my house, anybody who lives with me, anybody who stays with me, anybody called by my name, anyone or even my vicinity... We will serve the Lord. If not, here's your suitcase. Joshua didn't play any games with that. It's a very serious matter. Now, the Bible gives instructions to parents in Ephesians chapter 6, verses 1 through 4. This is what Paul said. I'm just going to go with one verse or two verses there. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Notice where children are instructed to obey their parents specifically. In the Lord. Honor your father and your mother, which is non-negotiable. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise attached to it. What is the promise that's attached to it? That it may be well with you and that you may live long on the earth. There's something that is triggered in the spirit realm uh, put into motion when children do not honor their father and their mother, do not obey them, don't listen to them, swear at them, disrespect them, curse. There is something that will bring, they will bring a curse on their own heads. It will not be well with them, and the devil will put a hook in their jaw big time. And we have personally seen situations where young people's lives have been snuffed out way too young. And it has to do with spiritual realities like this. That it may be well with you, that your life would go well, that you might be blessed and not cursed, and that you may actually live out the fullness of your days that God had planned according to Psalm 139. But people can alter God's plan with attitudes and choices. Now, so... Then Paul goes on to say, and you fathers do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the nurture and the discipline and the instruction of the Lord. So he gives a negative and a positive. What, what to, not to do and what to do. First he tells us what not to do as fathers. Don't provoke your children to anger. Don't make them angry. That means using a pattern of behavior or speech or treatment in such a way over a period of time so that your children become frustrated and embittered to the point of giving up and might even be boiling over. Colossians 3.21 puts it this way. Children, uh, fathers rather, do not exasperate your children that they might not lose heart. So the Amplified Bible says it, Colossians 3.21, this way. Do not be hard on your children or harass them, lest they be discouraged and feel inferior and frustrated. Do not break their spirit. So when ch fathers can provoke their children to wrath, this will cause their children to feel as though no matter what they do, they can never be pleasing. No matter what they do, they will never seem to measure up. You know why? Because someone is always moving the goalpost. Or the person just doesn't care. Wow, it's amazing, isn't it? We can have an impact. And guess what? Proverbs 18, 21 tells us, that death and life are in the power of the tongue. So we've got to also consider what kind of words are we using toward our children, toward our spouses? What kind of words? Are they words that build up and edify and bless? And Paul said, minister grace to the hearer? Or are they words that are filled with anger and tear down and tear up? Wow. And then other scripture in Proverbs 18 says it this way. There are those who speak rashly like the thrusting of a sword. But the tongue of the wise always brings healing. 
There are two ways to say the same thing, depending on the emotion and the spirit behind it. Now, there's no such thing. I'm going to let everybody off the hook, including myself. There's no such thing as a perfect father or a perfect mother. There's only one perfect father, and he's our heavenly father in heaven. And there's only one perfect son, and his name is Jesus, who came down from heaven to model for us, listen, the perfect father-son relationship. We earthly parents, though we want to be perfect, I mean, we don't want to make mistakes. We don't want to mishandle our children or our situations or raising and training them up well. We don't want to make mistakes, but we're going to. We're going to blow it. Moms and dads, and we've had to do this. When you blow it, you've got to take a time out and discuss it with your children and take responsibility for your mistake. Don't just say, well, I made a mistake, but that's not for you to talk about. No, may not be for them to talk about, but you should talk about it. Because you've got to explain to them. Again, this is part of the discipline. The discipline is the word, root word from, this, from which we get disciple, to make a student of. So you sit down and say, listen, Dad blew it. I'm sorry. I shouldn't have said that. I shouldn't have done that. I should have done this. I'm sorry I didn't have the time for that. But listen, let's pray together that I would tap into God's grace at a deeper level and I won't make that same mistake again. Because, kid, one of these days you're going to be a parent. So give me a break because you're going to go through the same thing. And what what are you going to want done to you in 20 years? Oh, I want my child to be nice. Then be nice to me. Because remember, I'm still your father. And that's never going to change. I mean, back talk, cursing, and it should never, ever, ever be tolerated. You know, the Bible tells us we need to nourish and nurture. That word nurture means to nourish. It means this, that as a good father, we need to provide a safe place. We need to provide food and shelter and clothing. But listen to this. We need to provide a safe atmosphere. A safe atmosphere where the whole family can be free to be themselves. Where people can be the most vulnerable and not be criticized for it. Not tolerate everything, but they can be real and vulnerable and not be criticized for that. That's the kind of atmosphere that we need to Create, don't we? All right, here we go. Listen, if you are not a dad today, but someday you have hopes of becoming a dad, I promise you this, now, today, is your time to learn this stuff. Because going into a relationship and certainly becoming a father, what you don't know will hurt you badly. So if you're a single young woman today and you have, you want to get married I promise you, what I'm about to cover in the next few minutes, this is the kind of man that you want to marry. Anybody lacking a whole bunch of these is not the guy you want to marry. I don't care how nice he is or how good looking he is. Let him be nice and good looking for someone else. You're going to be, other, you're going to be living a very lonely spiritual life. And that's going to get old when the luster of your uh, you know, your initial marital bliss wears off, then you're going to have years of towing it alone. Because if this guy just doesn't get it, sometimes he doesn't want to get it. And you better know the difference between the two. So let's cover a couple of these and we're going to quit. There are six things that dads can learn from our Heavenly Father, about godly parenting. Number one, as a loving father, he has adopted you into his family. That's the first thing we need to learn in terms of how God has treated us and then how we need to reciprocate in our earthly relationships. And so he has adopted you into his family. The Bible says that sin originally separated us from the Father. 
But Jesus came, gave his life, shed his blood. We know the story. And in that sacrifice, Paul said it best in 1 Corinthians 15, that everything that was lost by the sins of the first Adam was now restored and repaired by the atoning work of the last Adam, Jesus. Are you with me? And so now we have the possibility of being restored back into a relationship with the Father uh, that's unbroken and untainted, but it only can be accomplished by coming through Jesus Christ. And so through that process of what Jesus has done, guess what the Father says about us and guess how he views us? Let's look at the two scriptures. Paul said it this way, having predestined us, what are we predestined to? We are predestined in Christ to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself according to the good pleasure of his will. So the Father is saying, because of what my son does on that cross and because of what he's done, I'm going to receive you as full sons. Paul said it another way in Romans 8. We are therefore heirs of God and join heirs with Jesus Christ of all things. So we are heirs of all things because of what Jesus has done. So we are adopted into his family. Look at the second scripture. Paul said it this way. For you did not receive the spirit of adoption, I'm sorry, the spirit of bondage. Again, notice that word again. That means before you come to the Lord, you are in bondage. To what? To the power and the influence of sin and death. Listen, family behaviors, generational curses. You are in bondage to all those things. Fears, complexes, phobias, insecurities, all the issues of your past, who you were, your own broken self-image, your lack of healthy identity. All that is bondage that the devil uses to keep people down. And keep us, listen, it's called dysfunctionality. That's how he keeps people dysfunctional. Listen, if you are in a dysfunctional place this morning, you've got to give yourself to Jesus today. You've got to be begging him for deliverance. Because anything that's dysfunctional means exactly that. It will not ever function well. So if you are called to accomplish and to achieve you will never be able to do that if dysfunction still reigns in your life. I don't mean you'll ever have a, you won't ever have a problem again or have a thought or have to wrestle with some fears or insecurities. No, they're going to be there. But I'm talking about that power of that spirit that wants to keep you bound to those things. There's a difference between having a problem and the problem having you. And when you're dysfunctional, guess what? The problem has you. But you put on a nice suit, you look good, and people will not really necessarily know it until and unless they get to know you better. You say, wow, man, I never realized this person is so radically insecure. I mean, I didn't call them one day and they're ready to blow the relationship up. Why? Because immediately, I didn't call them one day, immediately in their mind, I don't like him anymore. Whoa, where did that come from? I'll tell you where it came from. Their fear, their insecurity, and their dysfunction. The enemy was able to use those broken places in them to paint a dark picture of your motives that weren't even true at all. Whoo. It's true. Am I hitting too close to home? All right, I'll pull back then. I'll go in someone else's neighborhood. All right. He said, we did not receive the spirit of bondage. Again, leading to even more fear, only a religious one this time. That's what Paul's saying. But instead, you receive the spirit of adoption. And notice, it's not just a little s. You didn't, you didn't, you didn't receive the philosophy of adoption. You didn't have to go through an adoption agency. This is not a human mechanism here. You receive the Holy Spirit, who is in himself the adopter. 
He's the spirit of truth. He's the spirit who restores. He's the spirit who works in us. Revealing Jesus to us. Opening God's word to us. Illuminating us. Giving us understanding of who we are. Who he is. Where did all this trash come from? And he gives us a plan to get out. We receive the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, what? Abba, Father. That means from God being an intolerant, religious, distant, emotionally disconnected God of the universe that has this massive baseball bat waiting to hammer somebody as though everything is on a performance-oriented treadmill or he's going to whack you. No, from that kind of broken image, I don't know about you, but I grew up in a religious setting. I didn't know God from a hole in the ground. But the problem is I thought I did. I was convinced that I did. I said this at Gloria Pizzo's funeral yesterday. I said what blew my mind most about when I came to Jesus, come to, really came to know Jesus Christ and was born again, was everything that I didn't know, I didn't know. I was unconsciously incompetent. <laughs> and to, you know, with this, this Abba, Father, that gives the word picture of someone crawling up in their daddy's lap and sitting there and kind of snuggling and laying their head on his chest and he's giving them a big hug and, you know, he's covering their ear and he's whispering to the other one, Daddy's here. It's all all right. No one's going to harm you here. Nothing's going to touch you here, baby. You are right where you need to be. Woo! Everything is good. Let me deal with everything else that I don't even want you to look at. So next time you read that Abba Father, wrap your head around that image. Now, how can you ever get that from a religious, a religious, limited, ridiculous understanding of God? You can't even remotely approach that unless you concoct it in a self-serving, by self-serving human means, which is to say, you know, well, God's just my, you know, me and God, we, we got a deal. You ever hear these morons talk like that? God and I, yeah, we got a deal. Yeah, and I know what the terms of the deal are. You do what you want, and he says, okay. I mean, it's just so hard to figure that out. Who wouldn't want that kind of contract? That's the greatest union you'll ever find. Okay, and, and exactly what is your deal? Well, you know what, he, you know, I feel like he helps me along the way and I make choices and if I screw up, he's there and if I ever get in a bind, you know, I ask him and he helps me and uh, yeah, well, you know what, uh, and typically if you follow their theology, if you will, down the road, yeah, yeah, so every time I hear a thunderstorm, I know that it's him saying no. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. And next, last time I looked at a waterfall, and I saw him in there. I think I saw a face appear under the, see, all of a sudden now you can't help but go off the rails into deception because you are actually touching into ancient Native American belief system. That's totally unbiblical. It's called animism and spiritism where God is in the elements instead of having created them and now stands apart from them. That's why even back in the Greek days and all the way through into the Native American culture, the God of thunder and is the God of rain. It's the God, you know, it's the sun God. It's the, and even in ancient Egyptian writings and hieroglyphics, you understand that this is nothing new. There's nothing new under the sun, but it doesn't mean any of that's biblical. There's only one Bible and there's one understanding of it. The Lord reveals himself with clarity and he gives understanding in his word. Anytime you don't approach his word and you want to try and understand God, you're going to get all messed up. You'll be filled with speculation and hypothesis. 
Wow. So let's go to one more. We'll quit right here. So that's the first thing, dads. Always cover your children. Nurture that atmosphere. You've got to be the protector and the provider. You've got to be the one that gets in the emotional game. Don't leave that for your wife. Don't leave that for the mother. Mothers are, by nature, nurturers. They love doing that. If a kid falls down and scrapes his knee, whoo, guess who's running over there? <laughs> and you mess with their little kid, guess who's going to be mad at you most? Mama bear. <laughs> See, their claws come out. But does it mean that they should be the only ones concerned like that? Absolutely not. And that's part of the problem that we have. Kids don't see that from their dads, and they should. Dads have to be emotionally engaged in the family, emotionally engaged with their children. Well, uh, that, that, that's your mother's department. Hold it. I didn't even say that about changing diapers. When our kids were little. I didn't like it. I kind of went like this. And in some cases like this. But I did what I had to do. I helped bring this child into the world. I need to help take care of that child. Okay. You got all the spit up all taken care of and the outfit changed and the diaper changed. and Yeah, okay, now I'll hold her. Mm -mm. Nope. You got to get all the way in. If you have to bring a vomit bag on the side of your changing table, you do that. <laughs> now there are some messes where I said, honey, please, please. This is above my pay grade here. This is just a total nuclear meltdown. How could a child have gone this much? You know those deals where it doesn't quite remain in the diaper? It doesn't stay in clothes? Yeah. Now that's what I'm talking about. Yeah, I'll change the diaper. Whoa! Give me the hazmat suit. <laughs> I remember fumbling around and I said, oh, honey, please. This is just above my pay grade. I can't, I just can't handle this one. Whoa, this is a senior level thing. I'm a freshman. <laughs> All right, one more point. Here we go. Second thing that a good dad can learn from our heavenly father is second. As a wise father, he is always molding you. You want to circle that word always. He is never in a place where he's not trying to mold us and shape us. Through good times, he's trying to mold us into an appreciative son or daughter of God. In the bad times, he's going to show us how, why it's important to toughen up, why it's important to trust him even in the valleys. He's trying to mold us because he is the one that causes all things to work together for our good. Not just the things that feel good, but he's working all things in this big stew and all those things combined will make us who we need to be. Because some of those things, listen, because some of those things break the flesh and build the spirit. You don't find any scripture where it says it's time to nurture the flesh other than with food. No. When every time the flesh is mentioned in Scripture, it's a negative. The flesh must die. The flesh is your biggest problem. Don't know. Listen, don't know people according to the flesh, but you better know them by the Spirit. Everything about the flesh is negative, and the flesh must go to that cross. The flesh is what the devil uses to keep you bound. He's got to use something, and he uses flesh. 
whether that's your mind, your thought realm, or the deeds that you wind up doing because your flesh is not submitted to Christ in an area or two. The flesh. So he's always molding us. Look at what David said on your notes there. For you formed my inward parts, Lord. You covered me, you covered me in my mother's womb. God loves us the way we are because he created us with a certain look, a certain personality. Listen, don't let God change your personality. In some cases, he's got to kind of uh, spruce shores up a little bit. Maybe in some cases, resurrect one that used to be there. But he doesn't want to alter your personality. He wants to alter your character and build your character. Your personality will always be in line with your gifting that the Holy Spirit has given you. Your personality will always be in line with, in sync with your gifting. So if you have a very talkative personality, guess what you probably have always been wired up to do? Be an evangelist. The question is, are you doing it? Or just do you, do you like to just talk about music, sports, the weather, politics? Stop all that nonsense. If you are a talkative, upbeat, kind of an exciter personality, you should be leading the pack in soul winning. Because that's what you'll be accountable for at the end of the day, according to the parable of the talents. That's just one little example. But it's important... He's made us this way. We are built a certain way. We're created a certain way by God. But he wants to mold our character to be like Jesus so that it can uphold our gifts and give place to our personality and everything works together. That's what will make you spiritually successful. As a dad, it's important that when you're involved in the lives of your children, that as the Lord has treated you and as you've been fearfully and wonderfully made, you have to understand that If you have three children, four children, they're all going to be unique and they're all going to be different. It's mind-boggling how different they can be, but they're going to be different. So that means you've got to seek God and say, Lord, give me insight into how I can best relate to each personality. How I can best nurture them and reach them so that I can bring them and train them up in the way that they should go. Does that make sense to you? we got to train our children consistently and methodically and scripturally, and it will bear fruit in the long run. You can't do it once a year. It's got to be consistent, line upon line, and methodical. You've got to have a plan as to how to nurture your family. It won't just happen by itself. You've got to help your children to discover how uniquely God has wired them And then help them to flow into a gifting and a calling that you'll see will start to make itself apparent. And then bring them into that. Having a secure identity. Having them be secure in your love, etc. Somebody put it this way. That parenting is not so much about molding as it is about unfolding. Opening up this beautiful gift and and learning how to work and use that well and how to construct that well and how to bring that unfolded gift into reality into, in terms of the real world. Okay, so that's what the Lord is always doing with us. He's always molding us. And I'll just stop here. You can write this scripture down. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 5 through 9. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 5 through 9. He said, love the Lord with all, your God, with all your heart and strength. And he said, impress these truths on your children. Do you understand that the, the implication of that study, those findings were this. Children need boundaries. And it blew the surveyor's mind. They expected the children to say, good, we're out of here. No, instead they said, uh-oh. You understand it's a very subliminal thing. We feel insecure without boundaries. That's why they went to the center. Don't listen to that cycle nut stuff. Read God's word. His word never fails. Let's stand, everybody.